Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss the effective application of microemulsions for the treatment of oily wastes. My name is Ray Petromali, Marketing Manager here at Elgin. Today's presentation will be around 45 minutes in length with a 15 minute question and answer segment at the end. Once we reach the question and answer segment, you could submit your questions using the chat icon located at the bottom of your screen. Today, we'll have two presenters discussing microemulsions. First is Mr. Michael Anderson, president of Elgin's Industrial Division. Mr. Anderson has over 30 years experience in solids control, dewatering, and waste management solutions. Second will be Sir John Harrison. He is one of the founding executives of the SAS group of companies and he's been operating in the oil and gas industry for over 20 years. John has been the key developer of specialist industrial microemulsion chemistries that are deployed throughout SAS operations globally for use in waste management, oil recovery, and enhanced oil production applications, and now primarily operates out of the UK, serving markets in the Americas and the Middle East. And with that being said, I will turn this over to Mr. Michael Anderson. Thank you very much, Rain. Uh, we'll just kind of have some introductory thoughts here and we'll probably be shutting off our cameras here so we can focus on the presentation. Uh, I do really sincerely appreciate Mr. John Harrison joining us today. Uh, it is fabulous to have him in, involved as a result of the nature of this technology, uh, the chemistry, uh, the load of information that SAS maintains and the experience they have with regards to microemulsions is really unparalleled in the market. Uh, and it's been a pleasure of Elgin to be working with the SAS team as it has developed a number of applications and uh, working on various systems across the world. So um, ultimately, um, you know, I will kind of kick things off. Uh, Mr. John Harrison and I will be passing things back and forth. Um, and uh, of course, at the end of the session, uh, once we do wrap up here in about 43 minutes or so, uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at that point. Uh, so with that said, I will go ahead and turn my camera off and we'll focus on the presentation and go from there. So um, as noted, we are talking about the effective application of microemulsions for the treatment of oily wastes. And uh, ultimately, we do see this as a significantly growing problem. And, and though we're representing just three particular examples here, and again, these examples are presented from some of the projects that SAS has been working on, um, there's an estimate 9 billion metric tons of oily waste that have been stockpiled globally. Um, but the interesting part about this is that what you're seeing here is really just kind of fundamentally showing you uh, earthen pits and areas where we've got oily sludges and waste that have been stockpiled. But this, not, this is not a problem reserved or limited simply to such environments as this. Uh, we have tens of thousands of tanks um, and other uh, structures that have been built that are holding oily waste and slop oil um, that are part of this problem. And in fact, it's become a growing problem because this growing buildup of these oily wastes have been con considered for far too long as something that's been uh, uneconomic or the technology doesn't exist to be able to go ahead and allow you to be able to create value out of treating this material. And in many cases, this has become as a result of the fact of, you know, if we don't point it out and we don't recognize it as a problem, it'll just kind of go away. Uh, the reality is, is that it's not going away. It's just getting bigger. And the other side of it is, is that there's an expectation in the market that we have something to do, that we have a responsibility, not only to ensure that we don't generate as much of these waste, but we have to clean up the mess that has been made. Uh, and hopefully we get through this presentation where we spend a bit of time talking about the nature of what it means to be able to clean up these wastes, the options that are out there beyond just a microemulsion or chemistry addition, um, but what we really can do to help this uh, situation and end up reducing the implications for such stockpile to continue to grow. I mean, the fact is, is that we're talking about 9 billion metric tons of oily waste that have been developed over the last probably century in a lot of areas, and there's no reason that, that has to continue to grow and continue to be a problem. So with that said, uh, I'm now going to pass it on to Mr. John Harrison, who's going to specifically talk about the nature and the chemistry capabilities and uh, what it means to be in microemulsion. So with that, Mr. Harrison, I'll take it and pass it to you. 
Thanks very much indeed, Michael. Thank you very much for the kind words of introduction. Um, you'll all be very glad to hear today that uh, this is not going to be a chemistry class. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be sighs of relief from uh, everybody uh, watching this presentation today. What I want to do is to uh, take this to a, a higher level and, and actually give everybody uh, just a brief description of uh, what it is that we're talking about here. Um, first of all, how it works, but secondly, and more importantly, what capabilities uh, does this bring uh, to your operation and to the industry at large? So uh, a microemulsion is really uh, a water-based cleaning solution. That's how you should think of these, uh, these chemistries. It's surfactant-based, that is to say, uh, it uses surface active agents, uh, detergents and soaps. These are all um, uh, phrases that we're familiar with. We use them every single day. So that's what I need you to uh, hold in your mind uh, as to what this chemistry is. It's a, a water-based uh, uh, cleaning solution, an aqueous wash fluid, and, and we are using this chemistry effectively to separate oil, water, and solids fractions from complex emulsified waste. So in summary, that's, that's what we're talking about today. Now microemulsions per se um, are very specialist uh, and we've just talked about the fact that these are effective cleaning agents, but these are much more powerful in terms of their capabilities than the normal cleaning agents that we're used to handling on a day by day basis. And they work in several different ways. They have a number of different modes of action uh, that all work in synergy and all complement each other. And I just want to run through a few of these at the moment just to explain how this chemistry actually works. First of all, it acts as a very strong detergent. Uh, that is to say uh, that the chemistry enables us to uh, lower the interfacial surface tension uh, to a degree where the, the, the cleaning application, the cleaning mode of action is, is very, very much more efficient. So any surface that uh, is contaminated with oil, this chemistry, when it comes into contact with these surfaces, uh, releases the oil from sticking to that surface. This is a very, very important uh, uh, mode of action for a number of reasons. Not only does it uh, effectively clean uh, the surface that is contaminated with oil, but it also drastically changes the behavior of the waste stream that we are trying to treat. Because we are converting oil wet surfaces into water wet surfaces, this has a, 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 a variety of knock-on effects that can be really very dramatic. If you can picture in your mind a solid particle, this may be uh, a bit of sand, uh, it may be uh, um, a clay particle, uh, but any solid particle within your waste stream that is coated with a layer of oil, a surface layer of oil, what this means is that uh, particles of this nature have a, a propensity to stick to each other and to stick to other surfaces. So quite often we see uh, these oily waste streams being very, very immobile, very, very viscous, very difficult to handle, very difficult to mobilize. At the same time, if you introduce these into an aqueous environment, because your particle is coated with oil, which is less dense than, than water, it makes that particle want to float. It suspends it in solution, and it even makes it want to, to float to the surface with oil. So this doesn't lend itself to centrifugation and being separated as, as three different phases. So bearing in that in mind, if you then strip that, that oil away and release the oil to the surface, uh, you actually generate a very, very different scenario. The waste is much more fluid, it's much more mobile, and you can actually recover the solids to the bottom and release the oil to the top. At the same time, this chemistry will also break emulsions. So anything that's tied up together in a, in a viscous emulsion, this chemistry will break it. It will release the oil in the water. And again, in lowering the viscosity of this waste, you enable the centrifugation process to really do its thing. So rather than processing a, a thick viscous waste like treacle, you end up treating a waste uh, which is much more uh, um, water-based, much more uh, uh, fluid, and therefore it allows centrifugation to work uh, much more effectively. And the last mode of action that we have is uh, the solvency that we apply. This can greatly help you to treat waste that have a, a paraffin wax content. Uh, it, will, it will reduce the effects of the wax, 
reduce the emulsification, and it will release the oil to surface. So the key difference between emulsions and microemulsions is that emulsions tend to disperse oil in water or water in oil, as is, is shown by these micellar structures on screen, whereas a microemulsion will actually help you separate these three different phases. And really what we've got here is a very, very robust chemistry, which allows you to treat a whole multitude of different waste streams. And we'll just guide you through uh, some of these waste streams now, just to give you a, a, an idea as to the, the scope and the range of scope that this chemistry has. Uh, next slide, please, Michael. So this chemistry can treat um, a variety of waste streams, irrespective of their origin and irrespective of the oil type within the waste. So it can treat drilling waste that might contain synthetic oils or mineral oils or diesel, but it can also treat at the other end of the spectrum waste streams that have been produced from production and refining operations. That is to say, waste streams that are contaminated with crude oil. Uh, any materials that are uh, resulting of uh, tank cleaning operations, oil contaminated land, legacy areas that have been uh, um, contaminated by oil spills, any uh, kind of situation where you have a material that contains an oil, a water, and a, a, a solids fraction, this is where our technology can be applied. And it can do so in order to carry out a clean face separation to recover those clean solids, a water fraction, and yield a free oil fraction at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So very quickly here, let's talk about uh, the competing technologies on the marketplace, because let's face it, this is not the only solution. Uh, there are a multitude of, of other technologies out there, uh, all of which have their place uh, in the market. But I'd like to focus on a few of these and just explain from our perspective as to where these technologies are, are lacking and where their limitations lie, especially when it comes to treating large volumes of these kind of wastes. There are many other chemicals that can be used. Uh, obviously, microemulsions uh, are, are one such chemical, but there are a huge plethora of, of other chemicals and other chemistries that can be used in waste treatment. But there's a few things to say about these approaches. Uh, the first one is that many of these chemicals tend to originate from a waste water treatment background. And in these cases, they can be extremely effective at treating primarily aqueous waste streams. But what we tend to find is that as we introduce oil into these waste streams, their efficacy and their efficiency starts to fall away. And the, the presence of oil starts to impact on how well they can perform. And in many cases, we end up creating a, a secondary problem, which is 10 times more difficult to treat than the initial problem presented to us. The second thing to mention is that sometimes we need to use a combination of different chemicals in order to achieve an end result. And that makes for quite complex uh, processing paths and, and also greatly increases the risk of something going wrong. The third thing to say is that many of these other chemistries are very, very sensitive to a number of environmental variables, whether that be temperature, whether that be salinity, or whether that be pH. And when you're dealing with all these different types of, of waste, those environmental variables are very diverse. And so what you need to have is a chemistry which is robust and, and able to operate efficiently, irrespective of those changes. And that's exactly what microemulsions do when others don't. I'd like to spend a, a very short period of time on thermal processing. And by thermal processing, we mean any kind of energy intensive uh, process that uh, that is used. For, for many decades, this has been the go-to solution of choice when it comes to treating these kind of waste streams. But in our opinion, this is very much outdated and is not necessarily fit for purpose in this case. Many of these wastes uh, that, that these kind of systems and technologies have been designed to treat have been very, very solid in nature with a very low liquid content and actually a small volume. Many thermal plants uh, only operate at, uh, at a few tons an hour, maybe five, 10 to tons an hour at best. It takes a huge, vast amount of energy to treat waste streams that have large liquid contents and especially high water contents. And so we really see them struggling in, in this kind of application. And added to that, 
in today's uh, climate uh, with a focus on ESG, with a focus on carbon footprint, which uh, Michael will talk about later in the presentation, this is not uh, a very sensible way to go. It has a huge carbon footprint for treating uh, very small volumes of waste. Centrifugation and other engineering techniques can be used on their own, but when it comes to very complex and very emulsified waste streams, centrifugation on its own may not be sufficient to achieve the, 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 the goals at the, at the end of the day and the targets that you need to reach. And there are a number of other applications uh, um, and technologies like land farming or bioremediation that by themselves do not necessarily um, uh, provide a, a workable solution. Uh, first up, these take uh, a tremendous amount of time. They take a tremendous amount of, of, of land area. If we're using stabilization methods, this might actually increase the volume of waste, uh, which is in nobody's benefit. And finally, and most importantly, in, in our case, it doesn't provide any value because you're not recovering any oil in this, in this process. You're basically stabilizing it, you're locking it away, or you're degrading it into carbon dioxide and water. So again, for all those reasons, uh, we believe these kinds of approach are lacking in some way uh, and, and don't necessarily deliver the same amount of value that microemulsions can. And in some parts of the world, uh, dilution is, is something that's used to try and water down uh, the, the environmental risk and, uh, and the threat that these waste streams have. But in many parts of the world, uh, that is now being um, uh, uh, disallowed. And we even now see uh, thermal uh, being disallowed in many regions of the world, primarily uh, for, the, for the reasons that we just mentioned. So on to the really important bit for me, which is the benefits that this technology can bring. First up, it can help you re reach your discharge compliance limits. In most cases, uh, we are needing to meet certain targets in relation to the outputs of any process, whether that be the, the oil level on the, on the solids that are produced, whether it be the BS and W content of the oil fraction that's being produced, or whether it be the solids content or the oil content in the water fraction that's being produced. These discharge limits uh, vary depending on the waste and depending on the geography in which you're operating. But irrespective of what your targets are, this, this chemistry can really help you uh, increase the efficiency of your treatment process and give you a much higher chance of meeting those targets effectively. In terms of the solids specifically, in some parts of the world, the solids need to be stackable. And, and from the, the process that we are running here, we are producing essentially a clean water wet solid fraction. That is to say, all of the oil will have been um, uh, clean from the solid and you'll end up with a, a water wet or a dry solid uh, uh, phase that's produced out of the back end of this process. That means that it can go to landfill. It means that that solid can also be used in other applications in relation to building aggregate, for example, or, or other construction applications that may be useful. So just because we're producing a solid doesn't mean to say that that necessarily should be regarded as a waste. If we're looking to drive a circular economy and maximize the amount of value that we, we can create from these treatment processes, this could actually have a value to you as a customer. The most important fraction though is the oil. Invariably, and especially these days with the oil price currently being at, up at around 120 bucks a barrel, this is where the value is at. And many of our customers are actually approaching us not necessarily from the environmental perspective and the environmental stewardship side of things to actually clean up their waste. They actually approach us because they want to recover the value. They want to recover the oil as a product from this, from this process. And this is uh, what we can do. Not only can we do that, but we can do this at extremely high rates of throughput. And so with a, a system that may only use uh, less than 500 kilowatts in power, we could be treating over 50 tons an hour of waste. And if that waste has a, a significant um, uh, percentage content of oil, then you are producing a very high rate of oil at uh, the end of this process. 
So this really can be a, a money-making machine. Most companies look at, at large volumes of waste of this nature, either think one of two things. It's A, it's going to cost me too much, or B, it's not going to be possible because the volume of waste to treat is too, too great. It will take me decades or hundreds of years to treat this, but we can do this in a very short time frame, and we can capture all that value at the same time. And it's these drivers, it's these benefits that are really pushing the use of microemulsions in waste management uh, to the fore at the moment. And that's really where, where it's taking us. Very good, John. I uh, appreciate that. Um, and actually, I think that it, it is, is important to note that when we start looking at the deployment of these microemulsions, um, it is uh, important to understand that we are talking about a chemistry, a very specialized chemistry. And that chemistry does uh, require not only an experience regard to how it's utilized, but a manner by which it's used within the system to be able to get the best results. Uh, and I'll be honest, I mean, at the end of the day, microemulsions are not a cheap throwaway style chemistry. It is something that you need to regard with some level of reverence and the fact that how you handle it, how you deploy it, and how you use it to get the best money for what investment is put into it really does come down to what those systems are that manage the injection and the overall process by which you actually utilize that microemulsion. And so that's where we're going to pivot at this point is take a look at all those elements that Mr. Harrison just talked about and how do we end up going ahead and deploying this in a practical way in the field. Um, first of all, planning is absolutely key. Um, and there is no way to be able to really short circuit that. Um, Pre-treatment is always going to be a, a key factor in making sure that you've got the right type of application, you've got the right type of conditions to make it as high of efficacy as possible. Um, but ultimately, once you start making an introduction of microemulsions, there are various steps that you need to consider. Very much like the utilization of organic polymers or inorganic polymers for dewatering or for the removal of ultrafine or colloidal solids, you do need to have some level of dosage and dilution bench testing knowing what level of dose is required and knowing what type of microemulsion structure is going to give the best results first starts with doing that bench testing. And uh, ultimately every plant at as soon as that bench testing is completed will be based on the foundation of those data or that data that was collected as a result of that bench testing. Um, so this is important. Uh, you may find that there's going to be two or three or four different chemistries that might be identified. Each of those chemistries then need to be identified relative to the percentage that they'd be injected. You wanna look at what type of mixing might be required, what level of contact, and that would all happen initially in a lab type of environment. I will say this is something that SAS is quite skilled in. Um, and if there's ever a need to kind of give that consideration, you've got a waste material that you'd like to have considered, um, it certainly would behoove you to go ahead and make contact with the SAS team to do so. At the point which dosage and dilution has been selected as a result of that bench testing, um, there is, you have to consider the manner by which the injections would occur. Um, and microemulsions are provided in both neat and or concentrated forms. Um, you can have them in diluted forms. Um, and depending on the way that you want to make sure you get the best contact, you may end up going ahead and having it in a strongly diluted or a largely diluted stream so that that stream can then go through and make that surface contact with the solids and the liquids as much as possible. Uh, unlike polymers, uh, especially when we talk about organic polymers or we talk about uh, polyacrylamides or we talk about even uh, inorganics in a flocculent perspective, they do not require a hydration. They do not require a residence time for them to become activated. Um, so it, ultimately, microemulsions can be in injected neatly directly into the line. And as long as there is a clear uh, connection or a interlock between the feed rate of solids and that dosage rate that was defined during the bench testing and that injection rate, uh, you will end up having a good scenario that will provide a great reaction. Uh, and that really comes back down, down to that third point that's noted, that precision measurement and control. Uh, in almost all cases, you're going to be utilizing some type of progressive cavity or some type of positive displacement, very precision-driven dosage system to ensure that you're getting that right dosage in. Once you've identified and you've taken all that effort to have the uh, microemulsions uh, set up and the tanks put in place and you've got the right testing done, 
uh, knowing what that dosage or dilution should be. Uh, at that point, you really do need to have a precise means by which you're doing that injection. And that comes about as a number of features that would end up into the system. Um, and that's also where you end up building out your interlocks and your flow meters and the different things that are needed to achieve that. And then again, at that point, once you've got the precision control and measurement, you really want to have that controlled mixing and residence time. Um, however, that residence time can be overdone, especially if you're ending up adding a bunch of shear to the system. Uh, micro emulsions do have the ability to be over sheared and you can actually break the efficacy of what you're trying to achieve by that micro emulsion by putting too much mixing or energy into it. And so it's very important that the means by which you make that injection, that you give a good quick mixing, good quick contact with much of the solids or the emulsion as possible, but you don't want to overbeat the dough. Um, once you go ahead and put too much energy into it, you can actually break it apart and not get the results you're looking for. And that's why the experience with the microemulsion chemistry and the actual systems that are deployed are very, very important in achieving the end results that you're looking for. Um, there are, and, and I will say that despite everything that's being talked here in regards to the systems integration and the things that are being done to plan appropriately, there are a number of poor boy, poor boy injection systems. Uh, quote unquote, that are out in the market uh, that can provide you an affordable capital equipment. But at the end of the day, you are talking about a relatively, uh, you know, chemistry that does cost money. Um, you're talking about a process that requires controlled injection and dosage. Uh, and many times you are just not going to get the results you're looking for if you don't have that controlled overall system to deploy that chemistry. And that's really what, you know, we come down to this next slide here. We're looking at the number of configuration, the different systems like dewatering systems that are utilizing polymers to remove um, ultra-fine and colloidal solids, microemulsions are utilized in a similar manner, I should say injected in a similar manner or have dosage that can go through a system that looks very similar to a traditional dewatering style system. Um, and these can be configured, set up in any way that is necessary uh, to be able to accommodate the nature of the system that's being put into place. Um, it is not uncommon to actually end up integrating systems that actually have uh, tote stands that you just be able to bring your totes directly into the system. And then you've got the chemical injection unit that's being able to plug into those tote stands. Um, you might have centrifuges that are incorporated in the system. Some might not have them. And you might have bigger, more complex systems that actually have various pretreatment systems organized into it. Uh, but the reality is that the site conditions, the characteristics of those oily wastes, um, will dictate what that overall system is going to look like and how you make that integration. However, this is really just one part of the overall scheme of things. When we talk about injection, we can't forget about the comment that was made five minutes ago about the fact that not only do you have to plan for the material handling of the system, but you also have to have various pretreatment systems in place to make sure that you're getting the best out of the chemistry. Um, I should say very similar to any other type of polymers that'd be used in dewatering. If you've got a abundance of solids or things that could have easily been removed or scalped from the system, um, you could end up going ahead and deploying a lot more chemistry and a lot more dilution that was needed. Um, and so there's reasons that you would end up looking at the overall bigger picture of the system. What you're seeing here on the screen uh, is a combination of different considerations for the deployment of microemulsions. Um, and all of these are involved in various forms of technology that you'd be able to easily find today. Uh, in fact, the one in the upper left-hand corner is a system operating in Abu Dhabi. Um, this system here utilizes a vertical cuttings drawer that's doing that initial scalp to remove out as much of the big solids as possible. Uh, then you can see there the actual totes of microemulsion that's being injected in the centrate coming out of the vertical cuttings drawer. You then got a decanter centrifuge to remove the solids from that. And then you've got a sophisticated wool water separation system that is then in the background there that all of this allows this to work in harmony. Um, as you look to the upper right hand corner, uh, this is a system that's actually been designed for an application down in Argentina. Uh, and in this particular case here, they've got these large pits that they're using a clamshell to be able to go ahead and grab the cuttings and the oil based sludges and wastes from. They're then bringing that up into a hopper system. Um, that is then feeding into the vertical cuttings drawer uh, and being going through the injection and a lot of the similar things that we're talking about in that last last upper left hand corner image that you're seeing there. And that particular representation, you're seeing that not only do they have storage tanks, 
for their oil and water, but they too are utilizing thermal desorption to bring the overall concentration of the oil-based cuttings from that three to 5% down to less than 1%. In fact, they're looking for being less than 0.1% by the addition of thermal desorption. However, I have to go back to that comment that Mr. Harrison made note of, um, we are finding a lot of areas that thermal desorption is just losing its luster. And it's not that it doesn't have the ability to treat. And I, we, I wanna be very careful not to indicate that thermal desorption is not an effective means to be able to treat. It certainly does. The challenge is that, are you creating a better situation by deploying that many millions of BTU and creating that many you know, tons of CO2 as a result of bringing your cuttings from, let's say, 5% by oil weight wet down to 1% by weight wet or 0.1%. And the fact is, that's a question that we've got to ask ourselves in an environment that really does uh, value having cleaner air uh, and finding ways to clean up for these wastes and, and having ways to accelerate uh, natural attenuation or whatever it might take to handle those solids that might come off at less than 5% by weight wet. The other systems, uh, the second one from the bottom and the green there is actually a system that both SAS and Elgin are working on at this point. Uh, SAS is taking the point on this. This is a very uh, extensive package that's being built up right now. Uh, SAS is working on this in the Middle East. And in this particular perspective here, you can see that not only they have the pits, uh, but they've got a number of feed hoppers and systems to pre-treat the material. Uh, at that point, it goes into a 40-foot integrated system uh, that has a vertical cuttings drawer as well as decanter centrifuges. Uh, you've got injection systems that are basically redundant throughout the system. And then you've got all the material handling systems built into this. You've got oil water separation. You've got oil tankage and water tankage. Um, you've got also the ability to go ahead and mix up different chemistries and do different things that need to be done. Uh, you've got compound, uh, impoundments for basically dump trucks to come in, bring the material offsite, as well as the ability to go ahead and stockpile it and put them into dump trucks. Uh, there's a lot being considered in this process. And ultimately what this comes down to is that an injection system is just one part of the overall process that needs to be considered. Um, when you're managing wastes, especially when you've got the tonnage and you're starting to talk about things where you want to be able to manage upwards of 20 to 40 tons an hour, uh, you need to plan accordingly in regards to the means of ingress and egress for your trucking. You have to plan in regards to your containment. You have to have a contingency plan built in. And there is a level of what would be considered this EPC uh, style engineering that you want to integrate. And this is something that SAS and Elgin and others have really sort of adopt as part of this OEM mentality that it's not just about going ahead and providing a piece of equipment and letting you go out there and make an injection. It's about providing the design and the engineering around the entire infrastructure and the ultimate goals that are trying to be achieved as a result of that deployment of that micro emulsion. And uh, whether or not it's just a semi-mobile architecture, um, like you'd see there in the bottom right-hand corners, um, where you've got systems that are designed to be able to go ahead and manage the treatment and injection, and uh, you can move this as you need on a mobile basis, where you've got relatively semi-permanent semi applications that you see in the top left and the top right, as well as the second one in the bottom there in the green. Um, those would be considered semi-permanent uh, or semi-mobile systems that technically speaking, you could go ahead and take that entire plant, that entire infrastructure and relocate all the capital equipment to a new pad somewhere else. And that's something that we really take pride in is that we wanna make sure that these assets have the greatest long-term value possible. And so it's not just about making equipment that can treat and manage these wastes, it's about making sure that those assets have the longest life possible with regard to the system that you're getting. So with that being said, uh, I'm now going to be passing this on to Mr. Harrison again, who's going to talk about the indications of success. And it's very important that relative to the deployment of the chemistries and the systems that are used, that there's means to really know what has tr what treatment level is what you're looking to target and what it really means. You know, we can talk all day long about the use of microemulsions and treating this material, but I think it's really good to see some of these visual indications. So you can see just what level of treatment and what level of chemistry or the physics that's taking place as a result of that deployment. So that said, I'll pass it back to Mr. Harrison. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Uh, here we've got a, a selection of case studies, if you will, just to really demonstrate the range of types of material that, that this combined technology can address. 
Uh, this is one of the uh, unique aspects of what we bring to the table here, uh, which, which helps to differentiate uh, this technology from other competing methodologies. Uh, many other competitors can, can either treat solids uh, or they can treat uh, liquids of a very aqueous nature or they can treat liquids of a very organic nature. But as you can see from this uh, brief array here, really what we've got here is something that is amazingly flexible and has the capacity to treat uh, everything and everything within this range. It can treat solids, it can treat aqueous liquid, and it, it can treat organic liquid. So we really do have a very broad scope of coverage and a lot of capabilities to bring to the table. On the left-hand side here, uh, what we can see is a, uh, a sample of slop oil. Uh, this is actually uh, from a, a drilling related application. And if you look very carefully at the bottle on the left-hand side, you can see uh, these, these solid materials and flocks and particles actually floating in the water, uh, being suspended in the water fraction and floating towards the top within the oil phase. This is what happens that I was trying to describe earlier when you have solid particles that are coated in oil. But then once you convert those particles from an oil wet to a, a water wet state uh, by the injection and mixing of the chemistry, you can achieve the result on the right. That is to say, all of the oil can be released to the surface. Uh, all of the solids having been completely cleaned can be separated as a lower phase. And in the middle, you've got uh, everything that's left over in the aqueous phase. So it's a, it can be a very, very dramatic before and after uh, scenario as a result of an effective treatment. In the middle, uh, we've got a, a solid, a typically uh, uh, oil contaminated solids fraction that has been cleaned. And in this case, rather than uh, uh, dosing directly uh, a microemulsion concentrate into the fluid, we, we would actually make up an aqueous wash solution and wash the solids with that solution and recover the oil as a separate phase. But again, as a before and after, you can see quite a striking difference. And this is achieved in a, a very, very short time frame, literally a matter of seconds within the engineering systems uh, that we deploy to the field. So this is not something that takes time and that we have to wait for. This is one of the reasons why we can achieve such a dramatic effect in such a short time scale and, and with such high rates of throughput. On the picture in the right here, this is uh, an example of a refinery crude oil waste. As you can see here, the, uh, the tables are turned ever so slightly in that although this is a, a liquid waste, it's primarily oil rather than water. But again, we can see just how effectively this chemistry can enable the separation so that we can recover the solids, recover the water fraction, and leave you with a very, very pure, high quality uh, oil fraction as essentially a product from this operation. Now, if you consider you've got a large volume of material with this uh, uh, high an oil content, this could be a highly profitable operation. And, and one of the benefits that we have in being able to carry out uh, this testing, this bench testing that, that Michael was referring to a moment ago is that First of all, we can make an assessment as to which chemistry works the best. We do have a, a number of different products within our, our remit. And so by carrying out this bench testing, we can find out very, very quickly which of our chemistries works the best and indeed at what kind of dose rate we need to apply it. So by, by being able to do this in the field, very simply at your uh, place of, of, of work, you can actually carry out all of your technical and commercial due diligence before you actually start running your operation on that particular batch of waste, or indeed before you decide to make an investment into this integrated solution. There is no risk here, there is no guesswork. We take everything away, we quantify how much chemistry is used, we qualify which chemistry needs to be used and how it needs to be supplied. And at the end of that, you can also quantify, for example, how much oil you recover. So you've got all the numbers and all the data right in front of you before you even begin. And finally, we just like to talk a bit more about these economics because ultimately at the end of the day, we're not just doing this for environmental stewardship, although that is important to us. We're also doing this because of the economic benefits to be had. The first uh, thing to say is that 
obviously resource recovery is key to success. The main driver for us in, in treating these wastes is to recover as much resource as possible, to, to add as much value, create as much value as possible. We don't do that by destroying the waste. We do that by recovering and extracting value from it. That value could be high quality oil. It could be the solids if you want to use the solids for, for an aggregate or a building material. And in some parts of the world, even water is a, a very valuable uh, commodity to have as a, as a product from this operation as well. Where water is scarce, if we're producing water from this operation, that water can then be reapplied into other industrial cleaning applications, uh, or indeed if we polish that water, it can go perhaps to irrigation or, or some other use. So when we look at these waste streams, we don't look at this as a cost. We look at this as an opportunity and an opportunity to create value and to really think about a, a circular economy here in how we can recover these resources and create value from that waste. When many of our customers look at large volumes of uh, heavily contaminated oil in a pond, uh, they basically joke with us that they look at this as being a, an oil production operation, except they don't need a rig. There's no risk of drilling a dry hole. They know exactly how much oil is there to be recovered and they know exactly what they need to do in order to produce that product. The second benefit though, is that we are reducing the volumes of waste for ultimate disposal. So there is a big waste management, uh, uh, waste minimization, I should say, uh, benefit to be had from adopting this approach. And we find that there are um, really valuable uh, takeaways from every point from treatment downstream. So clearly, if you're, if you're recovering all your fluids or your oil and your water, then you're, by definition, greatly reducing the cost of, uh, of trucking uh, the, the residual waste to a landfill. If you reduce your waste volume by 70 to 90 percent, that's a massive cost saving in ultimate transport and disposal cost. Uh, and also, at the same time, as Michael will allude to in a moment, it's also a massive potential reduction on carbon footprint for your operation if ESG is a focus for your business and is something that you need to reduce. And finally, uh, the, the solids that we produce, as we alluded to earlier, can be de declassified to such a degree that they could either be disposed of more cheaply, more cost effectively, or even better than that, we could actually use those solids as a product. Uh, so those solids themselves could have a value. So in many of these cases, what we're trying to achieve is, is a change of mindset in, in our customer base. Most companies will look at a volume of waste and they will think one question, how much is this going to cost me to treat it and dispose of it? Whereas actually, in, in this case, with the capabilities that this brings to the table, we believe that in some cases we can convert that cost center into a profit center. And if the volume of oil, for example, is significant and sufficient enough in the waste stream, and the volume is waste is, is significant enough, this can actually be regarded as an oil production operation. It can be a highly profitable process, especially with the oil price being in the range that it currently is. And with the, uh, with the amounts of oil that we see in many of these waste streams, quite often the, the content is 50 or 60 percent and upwards. And so at this point, I'll just hand over to, to Michael again, just one last time, just to guide us through a bit more on the uh, carbon footprint implications of what this uh, technology and combination can bring. Thank you, John. So I, I think it's important to note, you know, relative to this conversation, we are talking about micromotions, chemistries, we are talking about, you know, the treatment of oily waste, whether it be impoundments, earthen, whether it be a tanks, oily wastes, uh, drilling wastes. Uh, but the reality is, is that we have a very large volume of this material that's out there in the market today that needs to be dealt with, regardless of where it was generated, how it's stored or whatever it is. But even if we took one third of the estimated 9 billion metric tons of stockpiled oily waste and assumed that only one third of that contained recoverable oil and water, that would still be a billion metric tons of material that could avoid a landfill. And if we assume that each dump truck could handle 15 metric tons, we would be avoiding 66.7 million transport loads. And if we just assumed that each load was only 10 miles or 16 kilometers, 
away, which this is extremely conservative when I say that just 10 miles or 16 you know, kilometers away, and that each truck were able to achieve a mileage of 10 miles or 16 kilometers per gallon, then they'd only consume one gallon or 3.8 liters of diesel for each one of those trips. However, on that 66.7 million gallons or 250 million liters of diesel, we would be reducing the carbon footprint by 600,000 metric tons. And I think it, it, you know, sometimes we get caught up on the idea that this is a waste treatment process or that we're trying to go ahead and manage uh, areas that have large impoundments or tanks that have got wastes. But if done properly, this will truly have a CO2 implication. And going back to the comment that John Harrison just made about the idea that this becomes an oil producing type of environment. And if we said that, let's say even a portion of that 9 billion uh, metric tons of stockpiled waste, let's call it, you know, just one tenth of that actually is oil. Uh, and we end up with something closer to that 1 billion gallons of, or 1 billion metric tons of oil. Um, that is oil that does not need to be drilled or collected or refined. Um, it is material that is available, is a material that can be put into process and utilized. Uh, and yes, you're certainly going to have a B2 and CO2 content associated with the fact that it exists and it's used. But the idea that you would not have to drill for that or to collect that material because it's readily available is key, especially in environments where you also have water resource restrictions that you can actually be able to recover this water and utilize it for some generally good purpose. Uh, but we can't forget that just in the sake of considering trucking of these disposal or these stockpiled wastes, at some point they will have to be removed and those areas will have to be remediated if we don't find a process such as this that can reduce the volume of that material having to be taken to landfill, uh, we have the ability to remove 600,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions on these conservative numbers. So it's got a big implication. And then finally, as we talk and we kind of part with each of these presentations and keeping in mind that the, we already hit our 45 minute uh, timeline that we typically try to put in place, uh, you know, all these presentations and the things that we're trying to do here with regards to this webinar series, uh, it really is about coming up with a way to identify our technology and the effectiveness of deploying it and the quality of the personnel and the training that we use to uh, provide to those employees and the people that we entrust to operate those systems uh, is important that we certify, train, retrain those most valuable assets. Uh, what we've got to do is make sure that the industry is understanding of the nature of the technology, that there's things out there and resources available, and that the more that we do within our organizations, uh, the better that our own organization will be as well as the world we live in. So I appreciate everybody taking the time and coming on with us today. Um, it is just one in a series of webinars that we are doing and we'll continue to do over this next year and next this year and next year. Uh, we're going to continue to invest in this effort and do these type of training sessions. Uh, our goal is obviously to create a library of just very uh, objective, uh, non-sales driven uh, presentations that kind of highlight the nature of technology and these type of systems that are out there and available to individuals uh, for the use of it. So from my end, uh, I will close it there and say I do appreciate everybody looking, uh, coming in and joining us. Uh, and I'll give any last parting words that Mr. Harrison might have for us to kind of close things down here and move to the Q&A session of this discussion. Thanks, Michael. I think there's only one point uh, I would add, um, and that's really one of emphasis, which is the, the point that these solutions are mobile. Um, we are operating here in, in such a way in a, in a very compact uh, um, solution that can actually be taken to the treatment site. Many of the locations that, uh, that we are uh, being required to address are very remote in their nature uh, by by the nature of this this material the, the hazards that are associated with it it tends to accumulate in in very remote regions of the world uh, not easy to access and so rather than uh, having to transport these immense volumes of waste from their current storage location to a dedicated uh, treatment center what we can do is we can take the solution to the problem rather than the other way around. And if we can treat these wastes on location, recover those resources on location, and minimize the amount of logistics involved, just that one thing alone, that, that one capability, can make a huge, huge difference 
in terms of the environmental benefits and the carbon footprint associated with this whole operation. So uh, again, rather than, rather than having to transport massive volumes of waste, very long distances, sometimes hundreds of miles, not just 10 or 12 kilometers, uh, we are making uh, and proposing a, a very, very significant saving and a massive uh, benefit to the, uh, to the planet at the same time. No, that's great. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Harrison, for today's presentation. Once again, very informative. Um, now we will enter the question and answer phase. So if you would like to submit a question, you can click the chat icon in the bottom of your screen and we will get a chance to uh, get some answers for you. I'll give everybody a second to do that. Um, I also want to note that today's presentation, the recording of this webinar and the physical presentation will be made available for download. Uh, all those that are in attendance, you will be receiving a follow-up email with a link to our website where you'll be able to view the webinar, share it, of course, and download the presentation. We will also be advertising uh, upcoming presentations, and you will be able to view past presentations. So we have uh, several different possibilities there for you to go through. And then uh, you will also receive a survey. We appreciate you taking a moment to kind of help us improve this webinar series as we move forward. So we'll wait a second to see if we have any questions come across, but wanted to thank everybody in attendance for today. And Ray, on that note, and to the panelists, or to the, the individuals that are in attendance, um, as I noted, we will be doing this over the next, you know, this year, next year, uh, on a monthly basis, as we have been uh, this year. Um, and what I would say is that if you have recommendations or you would like a particular presentation to be framed around something that you, you would see in the industry that more information or insights needed in regards to solid liquid separation or waste management or environmental service in the field, uh, please don't hesitate to send us your recommendations. We would love to hear that. So uh, with that said, I do see a question here uh, on the API of the crude or the sludge that you've been treating. And I'll go ahead and pass that question on to Mr. Harrison to give some background on the thoughts and the different uh, types of API levels that they've had to engage to date. That's a very good question. Um, rather than give specific numbers, um, what I will say is that clearly, depending on the, the region of the world in which we're operating, we quite often are faced with a range of, of different types of crude. In some areas, the crude is, is very, very light and very easy to handle. And in some parts of the world, uh, clearly we're dealing with very, very heavy oils, uh, which have uh, very high uh, paraffin wax contents, maybe high asphaltene contents. And they are certainly without doubt, uh, much, much more difficult to treat. Uh, but it is worth saying that uh, many of our chemistries can help to reduce the API of the, of the crude um, in terms of enabling uh, a better treatment process. Sometimes we apply um, a small degree of, of heating in these applications, um, and that is usually done in areas where uh, the heating is, is freely available. So, for example, at refineries that have uh, excess steam heating being circulated around the site, uh, quite often we'll access that simply just to increase the efficiency of the process uh, because that energy is, is freely available. So yes, there are challenges uh, as, the, uh, as the API changes and as we get to, to treat more and more viscous wastes and heavier oils, it is undoubtedly uh, more difficult, uh, but nothing is impossible that we've seen to date. And John, there was a tag along on that that was asking about, you know, how did the how do these chemicals work when you treat sludge from pits, uh, sludge that may have polymers with it? Uh, do you see any implications associated with uh, polymer uh, sludges or something that might have a polymer incorporated in it in the sludge pits? That is a, an excellent question, and and actually that is one of the few uh, instances where this chemistry cannot be used. Uh, what, what we've learned uh, in our experience over the years is that uh, waste streams that have already been treated with polymer do prevent our chemistry from gaining access. But that's, uh, that's true for many other uh, chemistries. Once a polymer has been introduced, you really do need to use some very, very aggressive 
uh, form of treatment in order to effectively break the polymer. It's one of the biggest challenges we come across um, because many water treatment polymers end up treating these wastes, releasing some of the water, but then those polymers manage to agglomerate and, and, and stick together and produce a very oil wet sludge, uh, which is very tightly bound together so that we can't actually release the oil at that stage. So my, my advice at this stage is that if anybody is using polymers, uh, please stop and uh, please consider another option that may be able to provide you with more benefits without creating a secondary problem of very, very oil contaminated wet sludge, which is extremely challenging to treat. Okay, we had another question that is, what kind of effect does cold weather have on this process? That's a good question. Uh, certainly, we've operated at, at some uh, fairly extreme uh, temperatures, uh, both hot and cold, um, from the middle of the desert in the Middle East, up at 50 degrees, um, through to, to regions of northern Canada, where we've been at minus 20 um, in centigrade, obviously. Uh, this, this is a, a, a challenge, but in most cases, we, we have the option to winterize our chemistry. Uh, and in other cases, Clearly, if you're treating a waste stream, uh, it needs to be um, a, a fluid preferentially in order for it to be pumped and treated in the first place. So as long as the material is above freezing and it is actually a pumpable fluid, uh, then we can actually treat it. Um, but certainly if, if we're operating at, at just a few degrees above freezing, uh, that doesn't uh, uh, detract from the efficacy of the, of the, uh, of the chemistry and it certainly doesn't uh, detract from the, the efficiency of the process. So we do, we do have quite a robust approach to being able to treat materials at, at quite uh, extreme temperature ranges. Um, and so whether, whether you're operating in a, in a very hot environment or a very cold one, uh, we usually have a solution that we can uh, make it work. And John, I'd like to add to that, that you know, on that note, the chemistry itself is not grossly affected by the temperature and the environment that it's working or the ambient temperature. It's really gonna come down to the treatment systems and the material handling systems that you've got to keep in mind because the micro emulsion injection, uh, yes, that is of course the heart of the process that we're talking about, but far too often we find that the deployment of such technology does not give enough consideration and design and engineering effort to the other material handling systems and everything else. And as John was indicating there, there are a lot of systems, and we, we do these all the time, where we have to build them out as fully insulated, air-conditioned, climate-controlled environments. You have to use enclosed conveyors to be able to reduce the, the ability of things to be frozen or the wind blown or sun. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done to accommodate this, but uh, the cold weather itself does not affect it. But I will say that you want to make sure that the liquid and the oil are in liquid form. Um, so when we're talking about environments that are so cold that the solution or the slurry that comes in may have particles of ice or solids in them in that form, that can actually hurt uh, the overall reaction. And so you want to make sure that you've got a truly liquid form in the slurry composition that's coming in. Uh, so I just wanted to add that little note to that in the overall uh, topic. Okay, next question we have is would like to know a little bit about the quality of the base oil being recovered. Is there any restrictions for it to be used back to mix new oil-based mud, for example? Is there maybe any particle size analysis done on the recovered oil? That's a, a, very, um, a very good question. And actually it's more of a, a political question rather than a, a, a technical one. We have done many uh, studies over the years, both on recovered oil fractions, uh, whether it be uh, base oil for, for drilling fluids or whether it be uh, crude oil that's recovered in a, in a refinery. Um, we have found that it is certainly from a technical perspective, it's certainly possible to reuse uh, this material. And indeed, uh, we've even done studies whereby uh, whole mud has been recovered from drill cuttings and from, from a cleaning process and then we've made a, an evaluation uh, anonymously uh, to see if that whole mud can be recycled back into the active mud system. And, and more often than not, the answer is from a technical perspective, yes, it can. 
but from a uh, political perspective, uh, we quite often struggle uh, with contractual obligations being as they are, uh, with business models being as they are, um, for, for service companies or, or, or other companies operating at location to uh, accept uh, recovered fluids. So in, in all of our applications, we, we usually try and make sure that we have more than one uh, potential reuse of the recovered resources. Um, and, and quite often, uh, if it's not a primary uh, source, then we can uh, dispose to uh, a refinery, for example, uh, or some other uh, application or use uh, for the organic fraction that is recovered. Okay, another question we have, is it possible to add microemulsion prior to polymer addition? Uh, again, another, another very good question. Uh, we have worked with um, customers in the past to combine our technologies with, with other complementary chemistries. And absolutely, it is the case that we can use our chemistries in combination with polymers. But what is important is that our chemistry, the, the microemulsion chemistry, is applied first. Um, once, once the polymer is applied, it, it forms a barrier to our chemistry from doing its work. But if the microemulsion is supplied first, what we find is that the use of polymer can be very much more effective thereafter. And we can actually reduce the amount of polymer that's needed in order to be effective, uh, sometimes by up to an order of magnitude, which can greatly impact on the, uh, on the profitability of this process. And a good uh, example of this, uh, we've had um, some companies wanting to um, add polymer as a secondary step to actually clean up the water fraction that's produced. Um, and, and we've actually managed to do that in, in applying the microemulsion first uh, and the polymer second. Uh, in, that, in that case, we, we allow the microemulsion to do its job. And then the addition of polymer as a secondary treatment uh, can then do its job um, after that. So as long as we get the order of addition right, yes, absolutely, it is most definitely possible to do that. And we can also increase uh, the, the efficacy and the efficiency of the polymer at the same time. And John, I'd like to add that, you know, this also comes down to the overall orchestration of how the systems are set up. And to be clear, you know, yes, you can, you, micro emulsions would be the first step. In many cases, once you've actually pulled your aqueous layer out, if you want a very clean water discharge with zero suspended solids, you can then add your polymers in the form of flocculent and coagulant as a secondary step to create a crystal clear liquid discharge at that point by removing those colloidal and ultrafine solids. Now on that same note, going back to that topic of the prior question about the recovered oil and reusing it, you don't really have that ability to use those polymers in regard to dewatering or the idea of removing colloidal and ultrafine solids that might be left, left in the aqueous phase as you would in the oil phase, or I should say vice versa, that you don't have that opportunity. So you can indeed have very fine solids that may be remaining in the oil phase. And in many of the systems that both Elgin and SAS have worked on, you may go through a first step where you've got it going through a high-speed decanter centrifuge just as a pretreatment before it goes to a high-speed disc stack centrifuge to remove out any of the remaining solids that are there. And it's not uncommon to end up with an oil phase with less than 0.1% solids remaining in it after it's gone through a disc stack centrifuge. Um, but just keep in mind that unlike the aqueous phase, you don't really have that polymer chemistry to remove out and to give you a crystal clear water, you know, oil phase, I shouldn't say, you shouldn't use the term crystal clear, but you don't have that same flexibility to use those kind of polymers that will base side of it, but being able to send it through a disc stack centrifuge to clean it up is very much an option to end up creating a fluid stream that can be recovered right back into your system. Okay, we have one more question. What is the effect on high salt content and would this material work on grade two recovered oils from a TCC? That's a very interesting question. Um, to answer the salt uh, question first, um, that, that is not a problem for us. Uh, the microemulsion systems that, that we have uh, within our remit uh, can operate uh, in, in very uh, concentrated brines, both in, in monovalent and divalent brine environments. 
and in many of the uh, other industry applications uh, in which these uh, technologies are used, um, we are actually deploying the chemistry in saturated brine uh, as, a, as a treatment fluid. So the brine aspect um, is not a concern for me. Um, in relation to uh, the efficacy on this particular type of material, we'd be very interested to try it. Um, we haven't yet had the opportunity uh, to, to work with this material, um, but it does sound like uh, something that we could get our teeth into. And from both a, a technical and commercial challenge, uh, this is something that, uh, that we very much like to get involved in. So please do uh, get in, in touch with us and uh, we'll do our, our level best to work with you to understand the application, to understand what your, your targets and your aspirations are, and to see how best uh, we could go about uh, testing that uh, and delivering it in the field. No, that's great. We really appreciate uh, the information. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Harrison, thank you again for very educational application of microemulsions. We thank you all in attendee for today's webinar. Uh, that pretty much wraps us up for the day. So we went just five minutes over. So that actually did really well. As I said, most of all of you will get an email with a link to this presentation on our website. And with that being said, we want to thank you very much for attending and everyone have a great day.